Newly rotated Chair Serafin, uh, if you would please read the introduction and bring the meeting to order. We will, uh, we will, we will do that. So um, it is 3.01 p.m. and I will call this meeting of the Arms Policy Board to order. Um, at this point, I, I will just make a quick note that uh, due to the Governor uh, Pritzker and mayoral emergency COVID-19 orders, the Urbana City building will not be open to the public um, during this time. Uh, board members will meet remotely using Zoom webinar. You may watch the meeting on streaming services on Urbana Public Television or attend via Zoom. I also will note that there's been a rotation um, pursuant to their agreement uh, regarding the chair position currently now being held by Urbana. The vice chair is Champagne and the treasurer will be the Rentoul representative. Um, so Sanford, if you would please call the roll. All right, I'm just gonna call by uh, agency. Champagne police. Present. Um, let's see, uh, sheriff's office. Present. Rantoul police. Present. That is uh, Justin Bass in place of Tony Brown. Uh, University of Illinois police. Is present. And Urbana. Present. So um, at this point in your packets earlier provided were the uh, Arms Policy Board meeting minutes from the meeting on May 21st. I'll entertain a uh, motion to- Chief, before we go there, yes, are there any additions to the agenda? Well, we can do it that order too. Are there any additions to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go back to the Arms Policy Board meeting minutes from May 21st. And if um, I could get a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Moved by Anthony. Second. Second by uh, Dustin. Sure. Is there any uh, discussion regarding the minutes or any corrections that we need to make then at this time? All right, uh, I guess the, there's a motion to pass the minutes. Uh, with a, uh, Mr. Hess, please call the roll. Sure. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief Anthony Cobb. Yes. Sheriff Dustin Herman. Sorry, that was a yes. Chief Brian Serafin. Yes. Lieutenant Justin Baus. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes, that's correct. Thanks. Uh, and do, do you approve the minutes? Yes. And Chief Alice Carey? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, so that motion passes. Next item on the agenda is public input. Uh, at this time, we'll be using the public input rules for the city of Urbana, um, which uh, due to the small attendance uh, will be at five minutes. So at this point, if anyone would like to address the arms policy board, uh, please, uh, I guess, raise your hand virtually, um, or, and we will uh, make arrangements for that. While that is happening, I will note that no public input came in by email. Okay. Okay, then moving on, um, Sanford, staff reports, item number five on the agenda. I, I'm sorry, was there, there was no public input? I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not seeing any unless um, Mr. Jason. Liggett has seen something. So, Jason, just confirm before we move forward. No one has raised their hand. Okay, outstanding. All right. So, staff report. I'm going to turn it over to Tim and let Tim give a briefing on where things are. Okay. Um, development update. Uh, pretty much been devoting all of my time to NIBRS work aside from just minimal maintenance uh, to, to keep things rolling within ARMS. Um, so pretty much 99% of my time has been spent on that. As far as the NIBRS grant and programming work, um, we moved in some program changes uh, as we had uh, spec before on June the 10th to add new fields to uh, ARMS and field reporting for NIBRS for Leoka, justifiable homicide, custodial arrest, death, and non-fatal shootings, along with adding some values for criminal activity, bias, location, 
some other various uh, indicators within that. Uh, also removed a few values from vehicle property types and victim relationships. Uh, I've been devoting my time since then to working on the back end systems, which is translating the ARMS data to the ISP and FBI data submission formats, along with data validations and data transfers. Um, we've done some initial testing with the, the feds, and so far it's been successful. Uh, there's a lot of other variants of data that I need to continue testing. Um, we will probably need a little bit of third party assistance with the web interface uh, for actually transferring the large batches of data to the feds. I don't think we'll need a lot of help, but probably a little bit. Um, and part of that is uh, we don't have the specs really from the ISP yet for that part of the, the, uh, the project. Uh, ISP is uh, behind still on getting their test site ready, which they're supposed to have ready May 1st, and uh, it keeps getting pushed back partially due to COVID-19. Uh, they just released another set of specifications and offenses uh, about three weeks ago, I think. And it doesn't look like it matches the latest Fed specs, so we're waiting for some word on that too. Uh, so we'll still continue with what we can with that to, to get as much ready as possible. Um, we also oversee the latest state statute details from the ISP that they require for NIBRS reporting. Um, there are 515 offenses that are currently not in arms. And about 25% of those are variants of aggravated type offenses. Uh, we discussed those with the ARMS user group uh, in July when we met. We gave them lists of what those were. And at that point, um, the group recommended adding those offenses to ARMS and shooting for a target date of October 1st. Um, We'll, we'll provide listings of those statutes as well in advance for training because we're certain training will need to be, to be uh, required with each of the agencies just to get the officers familiar with that since, since these will show up in field reporting um, at this point at least unless uh, unless you folks have uh, a, a different opinion on it because uh, what I'd like to do is show you an example of, of how these are going to appear to patrol because they they're a bit eye-opening, so give me just a second here. I'll share my screen. I'm going to do a little color commentary while Tim's opening that up. Um, Tim, how many uh, variants of the aggravated uh, battery do we do officers see now? Um, let's see. Right now, if they're looking like for aggravated battery, they see five offenses come up, uh, the new offenses will show 49. So let me show you what, what we've done. We worked with UIPD. They've been extremely helpful, helpful with getting these things lined up because there's been a lot of matching they've had to do. But if you type in AGBAT, we've tried to clean them all up so that um, the AGBAT cases are all together. But um, you can see here there are said upwards of 49 of those to choose from now. Um, you know, the state requires, uh, well, they, they have different requirements for defining ag bat versus battery, um, as you probably all know, versus what the, the feds require. So the state has matched all these um, various statutes to the appropriate federal uh, a crime category, I guess, essentially, which the Fed only has, you know, a handful of, of categories that they used. So the, the big trick was for the state to match these. So anyway, I'd like opinions, first of all, um, you know, especially for those of you that have probably seen this in the past through the, the field reporting. Um, is, it, is this large enough that, that you, first of all, can look at the details on the screen? Tim, can you zoom on your browser a little bit? Is that... Uh, let me see. Let make a difference. Get that figured out. The problem is I need to move my display here. Let's try to zoom a bit. There you go. Get down here further. Then. So, there we 
or does that give you a better view of? So I, you know, I, I, I guess the, uh, it's not so much that, you know, we're, we're asking for an open-ended discussion. We just wanted to raise everybody's awareness of this because I think, you know, what's going to happen, we've talked about October 1st might be the day where we put all these 500 plus new codes in. It's going to change the experience for the officers and, um, you know, we want everybody to see what this looks like. Uh, there are two options, I, I guess, you know, I, I will put this out there. There's two choices. One choice, which is kind of what goes on now, is that the officers are given a very short list of choices. And then it's up to somebody in records to review those cases and choose the correct ILCS reference, uh, you know, incident code for reporting to the state. The other option, which is the one that the user group, you know, was pretty, was pretty um, fair, you know, there, there's wide agreement on this, was that officers should be presented with the full list and there could still be a level of review after that, but that it's important for officers to see all the codes. So um, I, I, I have a few, a few thoughts on this and, and I've had some discussions uh, in-house with this particular issue. And Anthony, I, I learned about this at some point when I was working with Pat Moose back many moons ago, and she would have to, at the end of the year for stats reporting, would go back in and then pull every ag bat report to see if it, indeed it counted for the, the federal FBI UCR. And she would look at the synopsis, and if that wasn't good, then she'd have to literally pull the paper file and try to say, all right, this this is severe enough that it would count for the feds because the state statutes were so much more specific and included things that were lesser that didn't rise to the level um, that the feds would count it. Um, so uh, having seen some of this over the years, I, I, and then I look at 49 choices. And that option was kind of a slow uh, process for Pat to do it, but I, I, I'm up for some discussion about whether we can get everybody picking right of the 49 or they got, they're going to go and find their favorite. <laughs> uh, these are the one or the two that we normally use, and I'm just going to use those and, and pick those um, and have a bunch of, a bunch of wrong data. So uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit torn. I don't want to necessarily make all the clerks do all the work, but I'm also afraid that we'll get bad data if, if we don't have at least some level of check on this. Uh, if I can chime in here as well, um, there's concern, but at the same token, we expect our officers to fill out the AWOL and put the appropriate charges on it, and most of the time they list the ILCS portion on there, correct me if I'm wrong, they don't do that. And that's, in essence, what these 49 categories are, breaking down their paragraph and what they're doing. Uh, I think if we create some type of cheat sheets, uh, or remember the boards you have up for the banner where you can go and look at know what our base are and so they can see what the choice are and they look up ahead of time and you figure out what the code is and opposed to going through the drop screen maybe speed some things up but we can find a way to make it easier for them their fingertips i think they'll land there uh, majority of the time um because they have to deal with the a walls and i just think about the uh sheets when you have to go through and flip through when you're in booking uh booking someone in to make sure you get the appropriate section of the charges in there that's what we're asking them to do uh, so there's probably going to be some training, some things, but it requires work. But I think we should keep the burden on our employees and put some checks and balance in at our records to make sure we're getting it right, opposed to uh, absolve them of and, and have somebody else to figure out. These are the uh, boys and girls who are investigating it. They should know what they're charging, in my opinion. Uh, and if they can't find it and charge it, then my question is, should they be arrested and making that charge? That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with that. We had actually, what we were doing now, and I think we could probably even carry over was that if ag battery came across when it came across Amy Coker's desk, she would just double check it. And currently she would say, okay, that's a federal one. That's not. So she wouldn't do it like Pat Moose would do the stats at the end of the year. She kind of did them as she went along. Um, and we would probably still need some of that at the, at the beginning of this for sure, because even if they make the right choice, there's so many, I could see somebody actually clicking on the wrong one occasionally. So um, it's just, a, it's just different. And I think as to Sanford's point, their eyes are good. They're going to go egg bat and they're just, their mouths are going to drop uh, when they see all the choices. 
and you know, I, I think it's important to note that we'll, you know, we're going to be communicating ahead of time. There's going to be lists provided to you know everybody a couple of weeks ahead of time. Shift briefings. You can talk about it. You know, I, I just, I, I want, I, for me, the most important thing is that you have seen it and get a sense of what it's going to be like when you start hearing about it uh, from, you know, from everybody else. So, Chief. Hey, Brian, I did a question as well. Um, you guys probably have the most robust case management aspect. Do you go back, uh, do you guys go back and clean up the records in your case management uh, after the state's turning off its charge it? So, I mean, we can write anything we want from what we think it should be. What it's actually charged at is what Julia's office is, and that's really the better code, in my opinion. And I don't know how robust you go back and clean that up. Um, would that be sure. the appropriate way to report it in based on what's actually charged? I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to cook the books or anything, but I'm just asking the question because what person ultimately charges what the state's turning off a file on it, all we're doing is recommending the charges. Um, right, so and, I, and, I, and I think, Anthony, the answer to that is – Yes, because Amy Coker is good. Mm -hmm. And so I think if she gets a disposition sheet back and it's this egg bat, but they actually charged a different one, she'll go in and actually change that. And mm -hmm. for the most part, for the cops, they're like, egg bat is egg bat, I'm moving on. Um, and if it's more refined, and, I, and, and it's my understanding that she does that at least to some, to some degree. I, I, I don't, but it's, that's something that she, I think, has taken on in an attempt to be ridiculously accurate, so. But with us kicking off this new process, if we all agreed and that's the way we go, then we're reporting apples to apples and having legitimate reporting based on what has been charged uh, in our community, uh, not what the officer thinks this and what the actual state's attorney office does. Uh, true, true, but there's a lot of them too, as you know, you write a lot of reports that we don't make arrests on. Or right. Or there are there are several there are those that are that no they choose not to file any any, any sort of complaint so I, I think we always are going to kind of go back to what does the officer think Amy's going to double check it and that'll probably be how it is I think um, I I guess I'm not prepared I believe that Amy does some level of correction when it comes back for that subset uh, okay that, that do come back no I appreciate it thank you yeah one other thing I wanted to mention too um, and and Chief Kerry, I'm not sure if your folks have given you an update on this, but they have mentioned that UIPD will actually most likely look up the offenses by statute, and we do have the full blown Illinois statute you know fully letter by letter that matches all the illinois statutes so um, it's it's pretty good and clean in that regard and and, and that's nice, Tim, because it didn't used to be that way. You'd read right. a statute and go. Well, this is a subset this because the kid was greater than five and the offender was more than 30 and blah, blah, blah. And you think, huh, there's no exact crime code or incident code. So we'll pick the closest one and keep on trucking. So Well, and also we consolidated a lot of incidents too, or offenses under, you know, the oh. generic, generic offenses, I guess, per se. So that also used up more space than what we had to cram all of those different paragraphs and you know sections in within those so this clean that up as well some too and quick question is there uh, any sections in there that are not Illinois statutes what happens if we charge someone federally how do we record those uh, is there a separate set of sections for that because uh, some signs some cases do go federal there are just a handful of federal offenses um, that the ISP has provided I know we've got a bunch of local ordinances too, um, but I, I don't think we have much at all in arms for federal offenses. There's like a wall, I think maybe is, is an example of one for military. Um, but I guess what's your, your question specifically on that chief? I guess my question is, is NIBRS that detail where they want to know how you're charging and where they're going? Can we put the state charge even though they're going federal on this now? Because right now everything's very generic. Uh, so if we arrest someone for uh, a large amount of, let's say, drugs, uh, and it happened to be methamphetamine, we're going to put drugs, methamphetamine, and, and it's good. Whether it went federal or state, we never really care. We just lumped it together in this category and count the stat. NIBRS is a lot more detailed for where they're looking at it. And so I'm trying to figure out if officers going to have to be able to uh, differentiate between how they charge federally and state, or is it just going to be the state stuff through the 40-hour, through the uh, training they get through, um, basic academy, uh, law and stuff like that, the things they should know, that's what we're talking about because basically what it looks like is there's now a 
uh, code for each section of law. So when you read aggravated battery in, in the law books, I mean, it's probably two, almost three pages long with almost 60 breakdowns of different things and how it can be when you look at it. And that's what you see in a section of why you have 49 different sections there. Sure. Well, the state or is the kind of the, the problem with this or the ones requiring the great level of detail. The feds have there are offense categories. There are maybe 30, I think, if even that. Okay. So the Fed, they don't have like federal offenses as separate offenses, aside from maybe just a handful of them. But those only come from federal agencies that, that actually would report those. Okay, cool. Thank Part you. That's another one that's kind of weird, which we don't have too much of. But beyond that, I don't, I don't think it really, you know, oversteps the boundaries of what we're doing with arms at this point. Okay. Tim, anything else in the staff report? Um, one last thing, I just wanted to mention that all agencies were able to have representatives uh, attend the virtual NIBRS training, uh, which was a requirement and uh, from the feds. So thank you everybody for getting that done. The sheriff's office had already done the training on that a year ago when I went through that as well. So, but everybody else has had, had folks in there. So thanks again. That's it. Questions? I want to um, just uh, second something Tim noted that uh, not only has Tim been working really hard on the sniper stuff, but um, Ed Cavanaugh and Alicia Walker from UIPD have been helping out and helping go through and classify and clean up those lists. I think you noticed that they, they seem cleaner in the reference to the ILCS numbers. So we appreciate their efforts and um, you know, kind of a bonus is that there will also, their work is also part of our grant fundable work. So the work that they're putting in helps the arms program in general because we can get some money back for their time. So thank you to UIPD for that though. All right, um, I guess continuing on the staff report, looks like there's a um, mention of the arms mainframe. Yeah, I'll hit that. Um, just a quick update. The the mainframe, mini mainframe box that runs ARMS uh, was reaching the original end of life for that was September of 2020, so next month. Um, we had initially received word from IBM that there would not be an extension. Well, there's been an extension. So we were able to sign a two-year contract uh, for support on that box. So we will be good through September of 2022. Um, now, keep in mind, we had a contingency plan, which was that we could pick up the arms program and move it over. And for example, the county has a, the same kind of, of you know, hardware. We could install it on their hardware and kind of keep going. It would have been a project. There would have been work and things like that. So it's even better that we were just able to leave it in place um, and extend the contract for two more years. So that give us, gives us some more time. Okay, any uh, reports of committees and officers? We do not have any. We have uh, new officers. Uh, just a, a reminder for the, the arms cycle, um, there will be a, at the end of October, we are due to send out an annual report. So there will be some numbers in that. And um, given that Rantoul is the treasurer, I'll reach out to Chief Brown and uh, we'll have a sit down and, and you know, he can potentially give a treasurer's report at the next meeting. Sorry. Very good. Unfinished business, item number seven, planning for a new RMS. Uh, the continual topic. Uh, <laughs> so I do have some news on this, even uh, very recent news. So last week I emailed out so a new batch of numbers. So the, the news is that those numbers are already out of date. Um, yeah, right. So what, you know, what you got from me last week was that I took uh, the cost estimate that we had from the vendor. Now, just a quick note about that cost estimate. The estimate that we had in hand expired at the end of July. And so I, I talked to the vendor and the vendor gave us another quote where they held pricing the same through December 31st of 2020. So this December, 
Um, they warned us though that that was they're giving us still the pr the pricing from 2019. So if we uh, if we ask for another quote in the future past December 31st, they will use the current pricing sheet. So you know some increase in everything across the board. So the good news is that we have our numbers; they stayed the same. Uh, the other good news, which you know I, I I'm a superstitious enough person not to say it's in the bag, but last time we met we talked about the possibility of two federal grant extensions it's looking good for those federal grants uh, one of them was going to extend the arms programming for the NIVRS work we have already depleted our first award the new award would be seventy thousand dollars of additional funding which we would turn around and we've been burning through something in the rate of seven to eight thousand dollars a month so that would um, we ran out of money in May so we're, you know, that would pretty much keep us going through at least through, you know, the beginning of 2021 calendar year. So looking good, but again, you know, until we have an award letter in hand, we don't want to declare victory. And then the other one, the big one was we asked them for $417,000 to help buy a new RMS system. And they gave us good, you know, good feedback on that. And uh, in both cases, we have the opportunity to apply for a non-competitive grant. So in other words, the Department of Justice said, hey, we have an award or we have a grant in exactly the amount that you have told us you're going to ask for that is waiting for you. We worked with uh, Chief Deputy Barrett to complete the applications, we got the applications in on time, which is the one place that we could have screwed things up, but it went in. And at this point, we have heard verbally from the Department of Justice folks at the beginning of August that things look good. Um, we are just waiting for that to go through its approval steps at the federal level. Is there a time frame for us when the approval steps are over with, or is it just the feds you just wait for them to tell you yay or nay? It's the feds, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, they, did, they did tell us that the award, we would have two years to spend the award. So, you know, I, it's not like they're going to get it to us and say, hey, you have to use it in three months. So, I, I, you know, I think that's good. So we'll see. Um, definitely when we get the final word, we'll uh, shoot a quick message giving everybody that news. So the, the numbers that I sent out last week were that I took the updated quote from the vendor and ran it through the same math, except I took the $417,000 and said, well, that'll pay for about a third of the project. Um, now, that, that's good information, but it's not final information, okay? So the, the, the update is that yesterday, Tim and I had a meeting with uh, the finance director from, from Champaign and the finance director from Urbana, so Kay Neese and Elizabeth Hannon, and the key discussion was to try to come up with an estimate for what the operating costs of the new RMS would be because there is going to have to be staff, overhead, hardware, software, all that kind of stuff is going to be part of that as well. Kay is doing a really fabulous job. She took the information that we provided. She's been talking to other folks. She is pulling together what I think is a very accurate estimate of what the real costs for everybody will be big picture. She's factoring in an assumption that this year, so currently we're, we're in the new arms fiscal year right now. For the remainder of this arms fiscal year, we will continue to bill people because you've already got it in your budgets, we assume, and it's just going already. You will not be billed for arms anymore after June 30th of 2021. After that, the arms program will run on the balance that's already in the arms fund. So this is the last fiscal year where you'll be paying into arms. So Kay's numbers include that assumption and she has what everybody's gonna be expected to pay, big picture for staff, support for the project, everything. So those numbers will be available pretty soon for everybody. Okay. Good. Um, the other thing that we discussed in that meeting yesterday is the intergovernmental agreement to form the new entity that will operate the new records management system. 
And so the action item is to go back to the legal people who were working on that IGA, which is a combination of Tom Yu from Champaign and Jim Simon from Urbana, and basically say, all right, you know, where are we at on this intergovernmental agreement? Um, the goal then would be to take that intergovernmental agreement and the budget amendment, uh, you know, the numbers for everybody, so that each agency could then get approval for that kind of combination of two things. We want to sign the intergovernmental agreement, we want to get the money for the new system, and that each agency would then have the opportunity to take that to the appropriate level for approval. Sheriff? Hey, Stanford. Um, I just want to make sure you're filling in the state's attorney on this. Um, as my attorney, um, just making sure that she's part of the intergovernmental agreement and things, because she'll need to review it before it goes to the county board. Got it. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I guess I, here's my attitude. I mean, everybody needs to review the intergovernmental agreement for sure. Um, you know, um, Urbana and Champaign, let them chew it through it the first round, and then we'll send it out for sure for everybody to, to have plenty of time for review. Um, in a best case scenario, best case scenario emphasize would be that we can kind of wrap all this stuff up in time to sign the contract using that December 31st pricing. So that's the goal. You know, it's doable. Um, it takes a lot of people working in the same direction, but that is a goal at this point. If we don't make the December 31st date, then, you know, we should assume the pricing will increase, you know, some percentage, um, but everything else can pretty much, you know, continue along the same path. Anything else on the uh, host agency discussion point? Um, so if I hear right, Sanford, then I need to make sure that maybe status check with Jim Simon on how that process is moving forward. I, I know that I thought that they were had a little um, momentum and then with the pandemic, it seemed to everybody uh, took off to doing other things. So yes. Um, yes. But yeah, I'd like to, I would like to try and get this. Um, I think that December 31st is a realistic and achievable goal. So um, good. Um, all right. Well, that will conclude that. Is there any new business before the uh, that we need to discuss here? All right. Well, seeing none, uh, it is 3.34. And if there's no further business, we will stand adjourned. So thank you all for attending today. And